Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, joining us for this online public lecture. My name is Esther, and I'm just going to run through a few little housekeeping bits and pieces um, before we hand over to Catherine for tonight's talk. Um, you'll have noticed that when you came in, all the microphones were muted and the videos have been switched off. Um, we'd ask you to keep it that way if you can, just to help the talk run as smoothly as possible. Um, the other thing to remind you is that we are recording this session, so if you do um, turn on your video or sound, you will be recorded and you may appear in the recording online. Um, we are recording the session and we're hoping that it will be available um, by the end of the week. If you want to catch up or share it with any colleagues, um, we will email you when it's available. After tonight's uh, talk, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the session. Uh, we've got two different options for this, so please use whichever one you're more comfortable with. So you can either ask your question to everybody in the chat facility, and we will ask your question to Catherine on your behalf. Um, the other option is that if you'd like to ask the question yourself, uh, you can raise your hand and we'll come to you at an appropriate point um, and you can ask your question to Catherine yourself. Um, if you want to raise your hand, um, this option can be found under participants and it should be the first button at the bottom. So my colleague, um, Alison and myself will facilitate the Q&A session. Um, so yeah, we'll let you know what you, we need you to do at that point. So please use whichever option um, you are more comfortable with. So I think that is enough from me. So at this point, I will hand over to Catherine for tonight's session. Thank you. Hello, my name is Catherine Brooke Wavell and many thanks for joining us today for this public lecture. If you think of a bone, you probably think of something like this. This is a human femur that's probably the best part of 100 years old and it's remained very much unchanged for a large proportion of that time. You can see it's a really strong structure that seems quite inert. And an important property of bone is to need that strength because bones need to support the body and protect our vital organs. But rather than being inert in life, bones are constantly being replaced and remodeled. We're replacing the whole skeleton every few years. And this is vital to our survival because bones store the calcium in the body. And that calcium is needed for the heart to beat, for instance. So during the day, after we eat a meal, we're storing calcium into bone, and then overnight that calcium is being released from bone. And because of this constant remodeling, bone is changing throughout the life cycle. And so it's not the inert, unchanging substance that we might think. Now the problem is that some of these changes, and particularly with age, can lead to a condition called osteoporosis, where the bones become weak and are more likely to fracture. So what we'll be thinking about today is how can we change bones? How can we use their dynamic abilities to make them adapt? And we know that bone responds to mechanical forces, the stresses that are applied to the bone. So could we use exercise to apply to the bone to change its mass and to change its shape to make it more resilient to osteoporotic fracture? The structure of bone it consists of a couple of different varieties. On the outside, we've got a layer of cortical bone, and this is really solid and dense, but very heavy. Then on the inside of the long bones, we've got this network of cross bridges called trabeculae. These tend to be filled in with red bone marrow, so they're much lighter and provide strength in more directions. In a vertebra, the bones in the spine, the body, the main weight bearing bit, also has a layer of cortical bone around the outside, and then the centre is filled with trabecular bone. This bone is constantly turned over. If we then zoom down in even more detail to look at the trabecular bone and imagine that we're looking at a small part of one cross bridge or trabeculum, then this consists largely of the matrix material outside the cells. And this is made of mineral, that's largely calcium. And this is a similar uh, structure to eggshell. 
and protein fibres to reinforce that, so it's not quite as brittle. And then we've got our cells, osteocytes, the mature bone cells, sitting within that matrix. So how do we manage to remodel this bone to release the calcium or to replace the bone if it becomes old or damaged? First of all, we've got specialised cells called osteoclasts that will attach to the old or damaged bone and produce acids or enzymes that will dissolve away an old piece of bone. They will then signal to other cells called osteoblasts, the bone building cells, and the osteoblasts will produce the protein part of bone, the osteoids. And as they surround themselves with bone matrix, they'll gradually mature into these mature bone cells called osteocytes. And as you can see, they've got these little arms sticking out so that they're in contact with a large part of the bone matrix and even adjoining osteocytes. And then finally, over the next couple of months, this osteoid is gradually mineralised to form new bone. So that the whole skeleton can gradually be renewed by the successive remodelling of small parts of bone and replacing that with new bone. What happens in the cortical bone, the really dense stuff that forms the outer shell? The cortical bone consists of repeating subunits called osteons. An osteon is a cylindrical shape. And in the shaft of a long bone, as in the shaft of this femur, we'll have lots of osteons lined up parallel to each other going up and down the bone. You can imagine that like having a bundle of spaghetti with all the pieces of spaghetti stuck together. And that will give us a lot of strength up and down. So to remodel the bone, we'll get osteoclasts tunneling their way through one osteon at a time in the same way a tunneling machine might dig a tunnel through a mountain. And they're creating a resorption cavity in the bone. Then again, they're signaling to the osteoblasts, the bone forming cells that are following up behind, producing osteoid and closing up this tunnel so that we're replacing the osteon one at a time. We can see this in this section through the bone of a young man and in a cross section we can see all the little circles of the slices through the osteons. Notice in the middle they've got a hollow which is a central canal which allows a blood vessel to pass through. And looking at a cross section we can see that some of the osteons appear white and these white osteons are old fully mineralised osteons. But interspersed within those, we've got some osteons that are looking darker or black. And these are osteons that are in the process of being replaced or that are newly formed where they're not yet fully mineralised. And so that we can see that by replacing it osteon at a time, we're able to renew the structure of cortical bone while still maintaining its strength and function. So this is how the remodelling happens, the replacement of old bone with new bone continuously. But we can see something else in this slide. Towards the surface of the bone, we can see a lot of new dark osteons all together. And so this is where we're adding, forming some new bone at the outer surface, where the bone is adapting or growing. If we want to measure that adaptation, we can use scanning techniques like dual X-ray absorptiometry or DEXA. This can measure the amount of mineral in the body. So we can look at the amount of bone mineral in the whole body, that might be a couple of kilograms, or in particular regions that we're interested in. For instance, the femur or the spine, the lumbar spine. And by doing that, we can look at changes in the bone mineral content over the life course. And we tend to gradually increase our bone mass and reach a peak perhaps in our 20s, depending which part of the skeleton you're looking at. We have substantial bone accrual, we're gaining bone up to this time, particularly over puberty where we've got really rapid bone gain. Then after the age of about 40, we tend to be gradually losing bone, maybe at about 1% a year, but with more rapid age-related loss in women. You'll notice that women also have lower values 
than men. This is partly because of smaller body size, but also women tend to have a lower bone density as well. So this means that a woman in particular, by the age of 80, might have lost almost a third of the mass of bone that she had as a young adult. Also, we want to have a look at bone shape. How can we do that? And to do that, we need to use technologies such as CT scanners. So this is a hospital CT scanner, but it can also be used to measure bone mineral. And this, by having someone pass through the ring, it can measure slices through the bone. Here we can see an image uh, from data gained from CT scans. And we can see, first of all, a reconstructed femur showing the shape. And we can see that it's got the ball bit of the ball and socket joint, the femoral head. Then it's got a femoral neck, the bit that touches the head onto the long shaft of the femur or the thigh bone. If we take a slice through this femoral neck, we can have a look at the contents. And we can see that in a 20 year old, we have a nice thick, strong ring of cortical bone all the way around the outside of the femoral neck. With the interior, we've got lots of cross bridges of the trabecular bone. If we look at an eight year old, we can see that although we've got a good amount of cortical bone at the lower part of the femoral neck, which carries more weight as we're walking, some parts of the outer cortical shell have become really thin. This might be as thin as 0.3 millimetres, for instance. So the bones are becoming like eggshell thin. We've also got a loss of the trabeculae from the centre of the femoral neck. And these are some of the changes that are characteristic of the condition known as osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is known as a systemic skeletal disease. It affects the whole of the skeleton. And where we get this deterioration of the tissue with the thinning of the cortical bone and loss of trabeculae. So some trabeculae might be thinner, some of them might be totally lost. And this of course means that the bone is going to be more fragile and more susceptible to breaking. So we've got the combination of reduced mass of bone, but also changes in structure. And osteoporosis is increasingly common in aging societies. It has been estimated that for a 50 year old, in their remaining lifetime, over half of women and a fifth of men will at some stage have a fracture, and a large portion of those are related to this loss of bone. These sites of fracture particularly include the ends of the bones, where there's a lot of trabecular bone, such as the vertebrae, the bone in the spine, and the hip. And it's hip fractures that are particularly detrimental, because after a hip fracture, it can take a long, lengthy hospitalisation during which time people might have succumbed to other conditions. And so that's why there's a huge cost to the NHS in the UK of osteoporotic fractures, in particular hip fractures. It's not just the mass of bone that's important, as I highlighted before, it's also the structure and the shape of bone. This study looked at the thickness of the outer cortical shell of bone in people who had a fracture of the femoral neck and compared it to healthy people who didn't have a fracture. And they found that in people who went on to have a femoral neck fracture, they had this patch of bone that was substantially thinner. You can see that's about 20% thinner on the top of the femoral neck in those people who went on to have hip fractures. There are also differences in the underlying trabecular bone as well. And we can see that again, we've got greater than 20% lower density of the trabecular bone in people that went on to have femoral neck fractures. So the shape of the bone is important as well as the mass of bone in predicting osteoporosis fracture. So what can we do about this? Is there any way that we can utilize bones properties of adaptation? Uh, we know that bones adapt and this is really important from an evolutionary perspective. If our bones were really dense and so robust that they were never going to break under any circumstances, they would be really, really heavy. It would take us a lot of energy to be able to run around. And so from an evolutionary perspective, it's ideal for our bones to be as light as possible whilst not breaking. 
And so to achieve that, the bones adapt to the forces that are applied to them. So if you're confined to bed for a long period of time, or if you go into space and you're a gravity-free environment, you'll tend to lose bone. And that might be at the rate of about 1% a month, whereas you might, with age, be losing about 1% a year. So immobility and a gravity-free environment is bad for bones. From the other point of view, if you put extra force on bone, for instance, exercising, that can increase bone mass. And we can see that displayed here in these MRI pictures of the arms of a male tennis player. On the left hand side, we can see the playing arm with much larger muscle. But also looking at the forearm bone, the radius here, we can see that there's much more bone present. There's a thicker cortex. And also the bone is a different shape, is more circular in the playing arm, whereas it seems more triangular in the non-playing arm. So this tells us that bones can adapt. And it's been proposed that bone has a mechanostat, so that in the same way that a thermostat might detect low temperature and then turn on the heater, the mechanostat can detect what force is occurring on bone and adapt it accordingly. So if we're in a situation where we've got our normal levels of loading on the bone, the forces the bone subject to as we walk around, for instance, apply a stress to the bone. And in the response to that, bone undergoes a very small deformation. It gets a little bit smaller. And this deformation is called the strain. If we do something that puts higher forces on bone, so instead of our normal walking and running, for instance, we're jumping out of a tree, that's going to put more stress on the bone, and that's going to generate higher strains on the bone. And these strains are thought to be detected by the osteoclasts, the cells sitting in the bone matrix. And they stimulate adaptation, so the bone will become thicker or stronger at these regions of really high strain, so that the stresses that are applied, and these increased stresses, if they're applied over a period of time, will generate less strain. And so the bone is adapted to be able to cope to that level of loading. So if we're applying very low strains to bone, as we are in space flight or without gravity, then we tend to be losing bone. We've got a negative change in bone. If we're applying the sorts of forces to bone that we experience our normal everyday life, then bone tends to stay fairly constant in its mass. If we apply slightly greater forces to bone than it, that it's adapted to, a moderate overload, and that's repeated over a period of time, then bone will adapt to become a little bit stronger. We'll get a slight increase in bone mass. But if we apply really high forces to bone, then the problem is that we can uh, cause fatigue to the bone or even fracture. So what we really want to do is see if we can apply moderate overload to the bone, gradually increase the forces that are applied to the bone so that the bone adapts and becomes a bit stronger. And once it's adapted, then we can increase the forces a little bit more. So we're staying in the moderate overload zone to increase bone mass. And a number of research studies around the world have tried this. And although some forms of exercise don't seem to have very much effect, so for instance, swimming or walking or cycling tend to put lower forces on the bones. Other forms of exercise that tend to put higher stresses on the bones tend to stimulate bone adaptation. So resistance training, for instance, can stimulate some of the greatest adaptations in the lumbar spine. So that might include exercises such as working out on gym machines or lifting weights or carrying heavy things. And doing weight bearing exercise, so ideally things like doing aerobics, some sort of sports where you're moving around more forcefully, running, etc., uh, tend to increase bone density and tend to have the greatest effects at the femoral neck. And the combination of both of these is ideal for increasing both of the spine and the hip, some of the most common fracture sites. But these are fairly small effects. You might think, well, 
Do we really benefit from a fairly small increase in bone density? It might be only a couple of percent uh, over a year, for instance. But the research studies that have looked at the effects of exercise on fracture risk have found that people who regularly exercise have substantially fewer fractures than people that don't. Why is this? It could be partly that people that exercise have better balance and coordination and might be less likely to fall over and hence break a bone that way. But it could be also that exercise is changing bone shape. And there's some evidence for this looking at and people who participate in different sports during adolescence. So this shows a scan through the tibia, the shin, in athletes who've taken part in different sports uh, during adolescence. And in the participant who was a control, who just did normal PE lessons at school, we can see a sort of triangular shape to the tibia. In someone that did running, so there are lots of forward and back forces, we can see that the bone is thickened at the front and the back, so is more narrow and longer. Whereas in someone that's played field hockey, where they might be running and moving around in lots of different directions, the bone is thickened in all directions. It's become wider as well as thickening at the front and the back. But can we change bone shape and change bone size in mature adults who haven't got this rapid bone growth we see in adolescents. And we looked at that with our hip hop studies. And in these studies, we asked our volunteers to do some exercises and they were asked to do 50 hops on one leg each day. So it only took a couple of minutes. They were hopping in slightly different directions, did a few hops with rest breaks in between. And they built up gradually to doing that. And we used hops because firstly, it's something that's fairly easy to do at home. But secondly, they did the leg hops on one leg so that the other leg could be used as a control. And we've done this in several groups of people. We've done one study in healthy men aged 60 to 80 years and another study in healthy women aged 55 to 70 years. And I have to say that these weren't people with severe osteoporosis or other health conditions. They're all screened to make sure they're healthy to start off with. And in all these participants, we did measurements. We measured their bone density by DEXA at the beginning of the study. And then after six to 12 months, after they'd been doing this hopping for a couple of minutes each day on one leg. Then we also measured bone shape. And in the men, we used the hip CT with the hospital based CT scanner. And in the women, so we could see the bone in more detail, we used what's known as high resolution peripheral QCT. So this only measured the tibia, the shin bone, but it gave us much more detail so we can look at the trabecular bone structure. Here we can see the changes in bone density. And we can see that in the men, there was an increase in the exercise leg, shown in red, and a decrease in the control leg. And this is what we'd expect to see. The men were exercising for a year and we'd expect to see a decline of about 1% over the course of a year. In the women, and the women were lucky, they got away with only exercising for six months, but we saw a similar increase in their bone density over this time. And again, there was a decrease in the control leg. So there seemed to be a net benefit of around a couple of percent to the bone density. Then we looked at what happened to the bone shape and the structure from the CT scans. So looking first of all at the outer cortical shell. And in this picture, we can see that the gray areas are areas that haven't changed very much. And the areas that show changes are in more color. And we can see we've got changes in some regions in the exercise leg of around seven, eight percent. And that we've got some of these changes in the top of the femoral neck, this region where there was a a thin patch in people who went on to have osteoporotic fractures. So this could be having some benefits to bone strength. Looking at the trabecular density in the layer underneath that outer cortical shell, again, we saw that some areas with substantial changes, up to 12% in some regions. And again, some of them were the regions that seemed to be important because there were regions that tend to be low in people that went on to have hip fractures. 
what about the trabecular bone in more detail? So these are scans from my colleagues Joanne Du and Simin Lee. And this is work that's fairly recent. It's just been submitted for publication. We can see at the top, we've got a cross section through the bone. We can see an outer layer of cortical bone, and we can see the trabecular in the middle. And this single slice at the top, we can see that there's some black areas that are the marrow, some white areas that have stayed as bone throughout. But we've got some green areas that started off as bone and have been dissolved away and some pink areas where new bones have been formed. So we're able to track what's happened to individual trabeculae. At the top, it's just a single slice. And at the bottom, it's a reconstruction of a 3D region of bone. And this has enabled us to look, for instance, at where we seem to be having an increase in the number of trabeculae in the bone after this exercise. So we've seen that the skeleton is constantly being remodeled and replaced through the lifetime. And that might depend on various things. Of course, it'll be affected if we aren't having enough calcium intake, but it also depends on the forces acting on the bone. We know that the amount of loading during growth can result in substantial differences, the bone density, and also in the bone shape, as we saw looking at the shin bones in runners and field hockey players. But we've demonstrated that even older people doing some exercise for a couple of minutes a day can increase bone density, but also produce substantially larger increases in the cortical bone and trabecular bone at some of the regions that are important for osteoporotic fracture. So this raises the possibility that this type of exercise or related types of exercise could be used to try and target bone if we can design personalised exercise interventions to try and strengthen the bone at the places that are important from osteoporotic fracture. As regards what type of exercise we already know is good for osteoporosis, the Royal Osteoporosis Society have recently launched a consensus statement. There's full details on the website, as well as plenty of resources for anyone that's interested in knowing what sort of exercise would be good for them. And as you can see, the sorts of exercise that are recommended include the weight bearing exercise with the moderate impact, like skipping, ball sports, running, etc. Uh, for most people, but in people with existing osteoporotic fractures, then some lower forms of lower impact forms of exercise, such as stair climbing, etc., might be more appropriate. And also some uh, muscle building exercise using weights or resistance machines, for instance, or everyday activities that build muscle strength. But also the risk of having a fracture depends on our risk of falling. So it's also important to maintain balance and coordination. And some types of exercise that might be good for that are things like doing Tai Chi, where you're moving your center of gravity or dancing. In addition, they have recommendations for people that already have vertebral fractures or might be at risk of them to try and improve posture by strengthening the muscles in the back. Thank you very much for listening today. I just wanted to thank a few people. First of all, all the many participants who've taken part in all of our research studies, and we couldn't have done this without them. Secondly, a number of students and colleagues, also collaborators from a variety of other universities and hospitals, and funders such as the Royal Osteoporosis Society. Thank you very much, and do let me know if you've got any questions. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, sorry for the slight problems um, <laughs> at the beginning there, but I think we got there in the end. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you can either put them into the chat now or raise your hand if, um, if you've got a question that you'd like to ask. Someone leaving, I think. I heard a door closing. <laughs> it's obviously very, oh, here we go. We've had a um, question come in. So for someone's mum who has broken two hips in the last three years, um, I'm 56 and don't want to do the same when I'm 80, 80 years old. Um, so I suppose is this, um, is the question, um, what, what can you do? at yeah. that age to prevent yeah. um, problems yeah. down the line. Um, yeah, and I think an important thing to find 
to point out is that whilst exercise can have some effect on bone density and help to reduce your risk of falling and potentially further effects through fitting bone shape, what we know has an even greater effect is some of the pharmaceutical treatments that are available nowadays. So I think with a family history, it's well worth speaking to a GP about it and taking their advice. And um, if there was low bone density, for instance, then there are some different medications that you could try and those have a substantial effect. And I, I, would, I would encourage you to consider those, but ideally exercise too alongside those. Um, and another one came in. So do, do yoga and Pilates work effectively as load bearing? That's a good question. There's fairly limited research on that. Um, they're definitely good in terms of improving posture and balance and beneficial from that point of view. The effects on bone density, are, are, there's not very strong research on that, only a fairly limited amount. Okay, is there anything that you can do to help your bones through diet? Definitely, yes. Um, most importantly, having enough calcium. And um, so there are calcium calculators that you can find if you look on the Royal Osteoporosis Society website and you can type in what you have fairly easily and check if that's enough. Also, vitamin D is really important because we need that to absorb calcium uh, and we can get that uh, through sunshine exposure, but uh, not if you live in this country for most of the year, unfortunately. Um, so um, it if uh, you can also get it through eating oily fish for instance some margarines but um, a few people might benefit from supplements as well and that can be worth investigating fantastic um alison have we had somebody wanting to ask a question we have just one second um, um. <laughs> We've got a, mess, uh, a question from um, Alison Clark, I believe, that has actually also sent a, a chat message in as well. Uh, okay, sorry, I didn't see it's come through on both. Um, is there any benefit evidence about the benefits of Nordic walking? Um, I'm not sure about that on top of my head. In terms of walking in general, um, tends to be more effective if it's brisk and with Nordic walking using the sticks, I think it tends to help. Um, it does have some benefit. And I think it depends very much on what's your starting point. Someone that's used to running marathons probably won't benefit so much or, or sort of doing some more vigorous exercise. But someone who's been less active, building up gradually, probably would get some benefit through sort of faster or more intense walking. And particularly sort of in the hip probably. Okay we've had a couple of questions about the hip hop study specifically so firstly how did you persuade your volunteers to hop on only one leg for a full year? Um, our volunteers are absolute fantastic people to be prepared to do this and yeah um, and we weren't paying anybody and everyone did it for the benefit of helping research and helping other people. So we're very grateful to them. Uh, yeah, the exercise only took a couple of minutes a day. And so hopefully, I and mean, I think people would say that maybe they do them sort of in the morning when they put the kettle on or something. So it didn't take, it didn't really affect their, their lifestyle too much. I think there's a couple of names I recognize on there as people having taken part in studies in the past. So I don't know if any of them would like to put a hand up and give their perspective on it. Have we got any takers for that? I'll just go to the uh, other question we've had about the hip hop study. Um, were there any injuries from the 50 hops on the same leg for a year? Uh, the, um, we just had one person who um, yeah, had something that they needed to see a physio for afterwards. Uh, a couple of people had some sort of temporary muscle soreness as you might often do when you start an exercise or some temporary soreness that they then sort of uh, reduce the exercise for a few days and then it recovered after that. Because people are concerned about uh, does exercise influence the joints, when we did the study in women, we actually also include an MRI scan of the knee uh, 
to see if we could see any changes in the knee joint. And we found that there weren't any detrimental effects on the cartilage or the other structures in the knee. Um, there weren't any beneficial effects either, but it's probably good news that it didn't seem to be doing any harm from that perspective. Okay. Would you get the benefits from the hopping exercises if you jumped using both legs or would you need to hop to one from one leg to the other to get the benefits? Uh, you would get some benefits from jumping. Hopping slightly alters the way you're carrying your weight and so it could be beneficial to do some jumps on alternate legs, if that makes sense, as well as just vertical jumping because the more that you can move in different directions, the more you're loading different regions of the bone that you might not normally load during everyday walking. And how many times a week would you need to do the hopping exercises to get the benefits? We had people doing the daily exercise and that was partly because we started off doing a study in younger women and we had some doing it twice a week, some four times a week, some seven times a week. And those that did it seven days a week saw the most benefit. The other thing is that feedback that people gave was that they actually found it easier to do if they're doing it every day because it came part of their daily routine. Whereas if you're doing something sort of two or three times a week that's done at home, it's easier to forget to do it or think, oh, I'll do it tomorrow and then miss some of it. But I think sort of the four, four days a week group in the young women also had some benefit too. So I think, you know, from four times a week would probably be beneficial and some research studies have had people exercising twice a week and have seen improvements as well for instance doing things like um, resistance training um, where you might be uh, lifting uh, reasonably heavy loads there um, we have sorry sorry, sorry Esther we have um, a question from uh, Anthony Locke I believe if he would like to unmute himself and ask the question i think i am i'm muted can you hear me yes we can um does uh, the exercise have any uh, effect on the um marrow the bone marrow um because if your bone marrow is producing a protein which has adverse effects obviously you need to be uh, careful not to do those things which may um cause protein to be exuded yeah yeah that's a really good question so in the bone marrow you have a lot of marrow that's producing cells that are important for bone function also for immune function and with age that tends to be replaced by fat by adipose tissue and some studies have shown that increased fat in the bone marrow is associated with increased risk of osteoporosis and osteoarthritis so we did actually look at this in the study in men and didn't see any significant effect there. Um, although we've not published that finding, so thank you very much for asking that. I took part in the uh, study um, some time ago and had to discontinue because there was uh, a protein being um, expelled by the bone marrow that uh, was building up in the heart. And clearly I couldn't wow. do the exercise with the the heart failure at that time so yeah. that's that's the root cause of my question i mean it was a very interesting exercise and and to answer the question that somebody was posing about doing it uh, it's very well worth doing if you're still running that kind of study because you do see a dramatic difference uh, between the leg which you're exercising and the other one and in, in the results which are shown Okay, good. Okay, just back to the hip hop study quickly. Um, we've had a comment from um, John who took part in the hopping exercise and enjoyed it very much. So that's good. Um, he's now 80. What is the best form of exercise for him to take to maintain his bone density? Yeah, it has to be said that um, sort of as you get older, you get the balance tips more in terms of the best thing to do being preventing falling over. Um, and so to do some sort of strength and balance training, although it doesn't particularly affect your bone density, it is good in terms of 
you know, a lot of people with bone density only break their bones when they fall on them. So definitely something that improves balance and coordination. In terms of um, maintaining bone density, there are lots of suggestions on the Royal Osteoporosis Society website. And I think the best thing to do is a thing that you enjoy and you carry on doing in some respects. If it's something that could combine a bit of working the muscles, and it could be some postural exercises to straighten the spine, uh, but also some exercises to strengthen the legs and the upper body, that's helpful. And that could be the sorts of exercises you can do at an exercise class or in a gym or even things like sort of digging the garden, for instance. And also a little bit of dynamic exercise. Um, so some dancing, if you enjoy dancing, or um, playing badminton or... Um, uh, yeah, there's something that you enjoy, uh, I think is a key thing. Uh, fantastic. If you are taking medication that affects bones such as steroids, would exercise still help? Um, I think that again, that there is some benefit, um, but if you're taking medication such as steroids, it's probably worth having sort of discussed with your doctor about whether there's any other action you should be taking as well. Okay, um, is it possible to damage bones through excessive weight bearing exercise or will it always have a positive effect? Um, yeah, so one of the uh, commonly known problems is so-called overuse injuries such as stress fractures that can happen in people that do large volumes of exercise and people for instance uh, running on hard ground. And so those are people that might be doing thousands and thousands of cycles of exercise. So, so that's one effect that you could damage bones by having that really high volume, having overuse injuries. The other way is if you do something that your, your, is greater than what your skeleton can withstand. So um, sort of jumping off, um, uh, sort of jumping out of a tree or something if you're not used to it and your skeleton might not be able to withstand that. So I think another point of view is it's good to make sure you're building up gradually from what you can already do to give the bone time to adapt and not doing something suddenly that's going to put really high levels of loading on the bone. So is the gradual build up the key part? Because we've had a similar question from um, somebody else who's managed to improve their bone density, but says uh, exercises on websites for osteoporosis tend to be very tame. So is just building up slowly the key? Yeah, progression is important. So once you adapt to one level of exercise to keep uh, maybe lifting a heavier weight, once you're finding the weight you're using lighter, um, to as, as far as bone is concerned, it tends to be the magnitude of the load that's more important. So if as, as far as bone is concerned, if you're running, for instance, running for an hour instead of 10 minutes, won't make that much difference. But what would make a difference would be running faster. Okay, we've had a few questions about martial arts as well. Um, can these be used to help with um, bone density and osteoporosis? Very good question. I think there's fairly limited information there. Obviously, the key thing to weigh up is firstly the potential benefits, um, but also the potential risk that if in a martial art, you might be more likely to end up on the floor suddenly. Um, is there a potential risk there? I'm not a martial art practitioner. I don't know if you practice martial arts, if you actually become good at falling, then it could be good from that perspective. Um, we've had a question about, uh, well, a specific drug, I think, and Nasrazole, which is used for a cancer treatment, lowers bone density. Are there any special exercises for a 71 year old that's taking this? Um, there have been a research, a few research studies on people taking treatment for cancers. I think, again, it's a matter of um, starting gently and doing what you're able to. If you're on treatment for a specific condition, it's probably worth checking with the doctor that's treated for. I'm not clinically trained, so do speak to your health practitioners about that. Um. Can osteoporosis be reversed? Um, yeah, that's a difficult one. So osteoporosis can be described or defined as 
low bone density and high risk of fracture. And so if you can modestly increase bone density, it could be that you take yourself out of the osteoporotic category into the normal category. So it, it tends to be though something that's sort of more gradually um, degenerative in, in that we tend to lose bone as we age. It okay. does jumping in the pool at an aqua class count um, as impact if you can't do impact um, exercise because of joint issues? And um, what you're doing in the pool is um, by reducing gravity, you're uh, reducing the forces on the joint. So um, again, that will reduce the force on the bone. So it'll probably have less effect. There are some studies that have found doing aqua aerobics using the sort of water weights have had some benefit on bone, um, but and sort of that sort of exercise will be very good for strengthening muscles and with stronger muscles, then you can be more active and that in itself can strengthen bone. Um, what about the menopause? Does this have any effect on the potential for bone strengthening and adaptation? Uh, yeah, um, so after menopause, we tend to have lower estrogen production. Estrogen is probably one of the most important hormones as regards bone health. Um, and so we see a decline in bone density after menopause. Some people have said that we might see less benefit after menopause, but we saw, as you saw, we had the slide where we compared the men and the women, and the women who are after menopause are not taking any estrogens, um, had as much benefit from the men, even though the women were only doing it for six months and the men were doing it for 12 months. So we've seen it is possible to show some benefit in the absence of estrogen, and that has been seen elsewhere as well. Um, okay, somebody asking specifically about degeneration of the spine in a child caused by overloading the bones at too young an age. Can this be repaired? Um, I'm afraid, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what... Um, yeah, I, I don't really know enough detail about what would be going on there, and I'm not sure whether that's my area as well. It sounds more like a clinical condition, maybe. So it may be about talking to their specific, um, their practitioner or GP about that one. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, should more be done to identify osteopenia so more intense exercise interventions can be used? Um, I've said someone that's never met anyone that's been screened for this. Um, yeah, sorry, could you just repeat the question? Um, should more be done to identify osteopenia? So, um, yeah, so osteopenia is uh, bone density that's um, below one standard deviation below the average for age, and that's something that's probably fairly typical for, um, for someone in their 50s or older because we go down with age. Um, I and mean, I think it's probably helpful for people with lower bone density, whichever range it's in, to be aware of it and to be able to um, exercise or to take pharmaceutical treatment if that's going to be appropriate for them. So the people with sort of lower bone density than osteopenia probably would want to be um, considering the pharmaceutical treatment as well as exercise. There is actually a website that you can go to and even without your bone density you can look at by looking at other risk factors at your risk of osteoporotic fracture called the FRAX website if you google that and you could put your details in there. That's F-R-A-X. You say we can include um, the web link on the email that we send around with the recording. Yeah, yeah. Um, what effect does obesity have on bone degeneration, density or strength? Uh, yeah, so it has a couple of effects. So firstly, we, if you put on weight, you've got more force acting on the bones. So that would tend to, in some respects, increase the bone density but the extra fat tends to have detrimental effects metabolically. And also the heavier you are, the more likely you are to fall over. So overall, it's a net negative effect 
Okay, um, we've had a question around balance. So someone who's 78 um, and does quite a lot of jogging but has a couple of falls a year, um, which they put down to um, balance and not picking their feet up properly and tend to trip on uneven get and ground. Is balance something that you've considered um, sort of as part of your studies? Yeah, um, balance is very important and um, it's quite important strengthening the muscles of the lower legs and it could be that helps with picking up the feet during walking, uh, during jogging. And that's, I mean, it could be that visiting a physiotherapist could be useful in terms of getting specific exercises to improve running. Um, more generally, um, balance could be improved by some sort of activities that involve stepping. Some people have looked at things like line dancing, for instance, or Tai Chi, where you're moving your centre of gravity. Yeah. Well, the next question is about Tai Chi. <laughs> have there been oh, any studies excellent. on how Tai Chi and health Qui Gong affect bone strength? Um, there have been a few and it tends to be, although it's conflicting, um, not very great effects, but so probably more important for improving balance. Okay. Um, so someone with a menopause that was induced by chemotherapy at the age of 47, would this have impacted on a recent diagnosis of osteoporosis of the spine at 73? I mean, it could be that either the slightly earlier than typical menopause, um, although it's not usually early, or the treatment could have contributed to some bone loss, yeah. Um, okay, if you build bone density in early life, will this increased bone size last into older age or is something that it needs to be maintained throughout the whole life? Uh, yeah, yeah early life is really important in particularly during puberty we tend to see much greater benefits to bone density and also changes in bone shape uh, that tend to be maintained for much longer if we start exercise in adults and uh, then stop we tend to return to where we were before whereas it does seem that exercise during childhood and particularly during puberty has longer lasting effects on bone Okay, we've got one more. Um, so I believe that as muscles fatigue, their ability to absorb the shock from contact decreases and increases the risk of fractures. Is it more worthwhile trying to increase muscle capacity and endurance or trying to increase bone mass? Um, yeah, so the, the muscle fatigue and effect on shock absorbing is one thing that could have a role in terms of stress fractures where you've got really high volumes of exercise. Um, in terms of getting bones to adapt, they'll often do that with a relatively low volume. So it's worth developing muscle endurance to reduce the fatigue and reduce the risk of the overuse injuries, but separately to have something that might be sort of high magnitude, but less volume. Right, people just keep using long words that I don't know. <laughs> uh, can you say anything about biophosphonates and infusions and the effects of these, please? Um, against the use of calcium and vitamin D supplements, or is it best to do both if you're at risk of developing osteoporosis? Yeah, so bisphosphonates are one of the most widely used medications for osteoporosis. As I'll repeat again this time point, I'm not a doctor, um, but there's substantial research showing that they can reduce the number of fractures. So for someone that's in a situation where they've been advised to be worth taking them, it's definitely worth taking them or considering that, uh, discussing them with your doctor. Um, calcium and vitamin D can have a modest effect, but it's smaller than the effect of bisphosphonates. Okay, fantastic. Right, I think we've had we have reached the end of the questions. If there's anyone whose question I've missed, um, please shout or wave now, because I'm sorry, I'm trying to juggle quite a lot of them coming in. But um, other than that, I think, I think that's a wrap. Um, we've had a couple of questions actually from people asking how they can volunteer.
um, specifically for your study, but I suppose Alison as well, I don't know if you'd like to chip in about how people can volunteer for NCSEM studies more generally. Yeah. Yes, certainly. Um, if there is anybody out there that would like to take part in study, um, in particular uh, to do physical activity, um, if you could email myself on the response email that I sent out with a link to this um, video, then we can connect you with the researchers. There's usually studies taking part at any one time, and so thank you for inquiring. Yeah, and I think we will tend to advertise our studies on the NCSEM website. And um, if um, we do keep a list of people that have got in touch and said they're interested in studies, and so we can send information if there's something out that they can be interested in. So if you Google my email address and if you want to send an email, um, we could try and send you information next time we're recruiting. At the moment, I'm sure that we don't have, uh, I think there probably won't be anything that we're looking for. Uh, within probably at least the next six months because we've got a um, um, a bit of a situation going on at the moment where we're social distancing and things. I don't know if I've heard about that. What's going on there? <laughs> so I think it, for our studies involving older people in particular, I think we're sort of feeling it's not the best time to encourage people to come into a university. Yeah. <laughs> Right, we've got some really positive comments um, in the talk, in the chat, so I think um, everybody's really enjoying enjoyed the talk. So thank you very much for your time. Um, we have recorded this session, so we will aim to get that out by the end of the week, and we'll send everybody an email um, when it's ready to view. But thank you very much.